happening. Kurum Wafa is, is going to talk about Cardi formula and the black hole entropy. Thank you. Uh, thanks uh, to the organizer for organizing this amazing conference and also giving me a chance to give a talk here. Um, I'm going to talk about a work I've done recently with uh, Indranil Halder and Kai Chu related to an old story. The story is uh, about the, uh, how do we account for the black hole entropy and what is the relation of that to the Cardi formula. Um, so microscopic explanation of Bekenstein uh, Hawking entropy is one of the first concrete evidences that we found in string theory that said that we perhaps have the right ingredients in string theory to describe quantum gravity. It accounted uh, correctly for the black hole entropy in particular. Uh, but the typical way this gets done is a little bizarre, I would say, still. At least the typical way people have done is a little bit funny. Namely, we relate the black hole to a black string. It's not a direct thing. It's always an indirect path. Uh, and the typical way is one considers a theory in, if you're interested in a d-dimensional theory with black holes in d-dimensions, you first of all find the theory in one higher dimension. So you go to d plus one dimension and find the theory which uh, equivalent to the theory you're interested in upon a circle compactification. Then you realize the charged states that you have in d-dimension, the black hole that you're interested in studying in d dimensions to the states of the wrapped string, strings wrapped around the circle in the one higher dimensional theory. So you choose the string carrying various charges and in addition can wrap around the string and also have momentum around the circle. circle. And with momentum and the uh, wrapping around the circle together with the extra charges, you can potentially account for all the allowed charges that you might have in the lower dimensional theory. And then in the limit that you are getting the large amount of momentum around the circle, you can use the Cardi formula if you know what is living on this string. In particular, all you need to know is what is the central charge of the string. You can predict how many states live on it, at least asymptotically when there's a large momentum, using the usual formula that Cardi uh, uh, found, that namely you find the the fact that the, uh, by module transformation, the partition function gets related to the Q to the minus C over 24. And using that behavior, you can estimate the asymptotic growth of states. And you get a formula which accounts for the black hole entropy in this, in this way for large enough n. So that is the typical way that the accounting of the black hole entropy has been done in string theory. As you can see, it's a little indirect. Uh, and uh, a bit strange why a string shows up. And the question we were curious is whether or not strings always shows up in a black hole situation, or is it just the artificial feature of some of the examples that people have studied? So uh, the C will depend, the central charge of the, uh, the string we are talking about will depend on the charges it carries. And uh, in some cases, one can do better and uh, we can actually account for the exact degeneracy of the black hole entropy index, not just asymptotically. So here I have to clarify what do I mean by black hole entropy index. So black hole entropy, you just count the number of states of black hole. But black hole entropy index is in the context where we have a supersymmetric black hole and there's an index which you can compute, which is invariant, which is simpler to compute. Now, a priori, the black hole entropy index is in absolute value smaller than the black hole entropy because you have some plus or minus cancellations potentially. Typically, what we find is that there are no cancellations at least to leading order, and this works nicely, and we can get our answer. Now, this is not always correct. We have counterexamples where this does not happen. So, so here, today, I'm only going to talk about black hole entropy index, where things can be actually computed uh, in a relatively straightforward fashion. And most of the times, that actually agrees with the black hole entropy, at least to the leading order. And uh, in some cases, you can actually compute this exactly, for example, in the context of if you take five-dimensional black holes and you consider M theory on uh, T6 or K3 cross T2, as were the first kinds of examples people studied for the black holes, you find that you get things having to do with the elliptic genus of symmetric products of 
uh, uh, products of K3 or T4. And this kind of thing has people have studied and give you the right uh, uh, entropy for the black hole leading order as well as all the corrections. And they, they work beautifully well. So um, the next question, of course, once you study these cases, does this work for arbitrary Calabia threefold? Is there a similar story for if you change T6 and K3 cross T2 and replace it by arbitrary Calabia threefolds? Now, in fact, for Calabia threefold, more generally, there are other ways to, at least in principle, compute the black hole entropy without appealing to a string. So there, you don't need a string a priori to get to the black hole. And the idea would be, if you compute topological uh, strings, topological A model, on a Calabia threefold in particular, you get a count of BPS degeneracies of particles in five dimensions, labeled by a charge Q and by a spin J. So in other words, uh, in five dimension, the rotation group is SO4, and that is SU2 times SU2, two SU2s in it. One of them, if you're interested in supersymmetric spinning black hole, the spin can only be, be inside one of the SU2s. So, so you would ask, if, I, if you're interested in the BPS spinning black holes in 5D, you'll be asking about the charge and the spin sitting in one of the SU2s, and you ask, what is this number? And the answer is, if you compute topological string as a function of Kähler moduli T and the string coupling constant lambda, you can recapture that in terms of this, this structure where the degeneracies of these BPS states ends appear, and this generating function for these BPS particles gets related to the topological string amplitude. So, so if you know how to compute topological string amplitudes, you, have, you are done with computing the supersymmetric BPS black holes in 5D, at least the ones you get from Calabia for arbitrary charge and spin. Now, you might say, okay, suppose I don't know how to calculate the charge, the, the, the spin part, but I just sum over all possible spins. Do I get the right answer for just the charge dependence without caring about the spins if I added up all the spins with the minus one to the fermion boson degeneracy and add them up? And the answer is no. That's one of the cases where the index cancels quite a bit. So you get the wrong leading behavior. So you really need to distinguish which spin you're talking about to get potentially the right answer. And then it becomes very difficult. For example, if you are interested in this a genus zero answer of topological string, which you can easily compute using period of mirror, mirror symmetry, you would be able to compute the charge, but not the spin. And the spin would be your summing over all the spin with the plus or minus signs, and you get the wrong behavior. You get the growth of the BPS black holes would have gone like exponentially in charge rather than charge to the three half. So you get the wrong power even leading order. So that's an example where the leading order would not have worked. So you really have to distinguish the spin correctly to get potentially the right answer. And then that becomes difficult. So if you have, for example, a particular uh, genus ca calculation, 0, 1, 2, et cetera, if you go down to higher genus, and then there's a charge, so you get the charges contribute to the, to the uh, a given charge contributes to all genus in principle, but for a fixed charge, after some genus, it, it starts after a, a you get some kind of uh, no contribution up to a given order, and then it starts. So if you're interested in low enough charge, you can stop by, uh, by computing topological string up to a given genus. So therefore, by finite computation, you can get the answer to a finite charge if you're interested in doing it. But the asymptotic formulas we're interested in only starts for large charge. So therefore, to get the full answer, you have to do all genus topological string answers. It is a bit embarrassing that after all these decades, we still don't have a single Calabia, a compact Calabia, for which we know the full answer for topological string, for which we can do this check. We, all, we have answers for non-compact Calabia, and in particular, toric ones, but it does not apply to the case of black holes that we are interested in. So we don't have the techniques to do it. I mean, there have been beautiful progress in this direction by Albrecht, for example, and uh, his collaborators, where they can push the computation of topological string to a very high genus, 50 was a while back, now the record is, I don't know, 90 or whatever. So you can really push it up by various techniques and asymptotic studies of uh, topological string amplitudes, but not really much bigger. I mean, we still are not in the asymptotic regime. Nevertheless, people have used this large enough quote-unquote value and checked these formulas, and they kind of work. That is, 
you get kind of the expected supergravity answer if you just charge 100 or charge a 50 or whatever, which is close to being big. And so it kind of begins to work. More than that, they actually looked at the, some people, in particular Indranil and his collaborators, look at even the spin dependence. And in that context, you have a spinning black holes and spinning black rings. And the, 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 the description of the black ring entropy and the black holes are not the same. There's a different behavior. And they, they also saw features of that using topological string computation. So the topological string computation is quite a, an interesting avenue to try to kind of connect with extremely interesting physics, including black holes, black rings, and so on, that we still haven't done. So it gives more motivation to try to find ways to actually compute topological string amplitudes for compact Calabria threefolds, which we still don't know how to do. So I already mentioned some of the progress that has been made here by, uh, by various groups. However, uh, there is one particular class of Calabria that you can do another trick. And that is for M theory on elliptic Calabria. If you're interested in elliptic Calabria, in this case, the BPS is, of course, as, as, as general case, for any Calabria, the BPS is our M2 brains. But for elliptic Calabria, you can push it one dimension higher. In this case, you can push it to F theory in six dimensions. In other words, take F theory on elliptic Calabria, you get the theory in six dimensions. And this gives you a way to realize the strings in 5D, which corresponds to M2 brains, uh, the BPS, uh, sorry, BPS back holes in 5D to a string in 6D, which is wrapped around the circle. And that is the technique that people have used. So let me review what, how that works. So suppose you have an elliptic Calabria threefold with a base B and an elliptic fiber E. So uh, the F theory compactifications, you have, uh, it's the same as, as usual, compact fire on a B with the seven brains, uh, PQ seven brains, which capture the monodromy of the coupling constant on the base. And so you have roughly this picture, you have a base and you have an elliptic fiber. And then you look at the two cycle classes inside the base, for example, and you can wrap D3 brains of, of type 2B along these uh, cycles, two cycles, and that gives you a string in 6D. So if you take this theory, which is in six dimensions, and wrap it around the circle, and wrap the D3 brain around the circle, then you get a BPS black hole in 5D corresponding to elliptic threefold that corresponds to this one. Uh, so if this is the picture for that. So you have the base, the elliptic fiber, the two cycle class, you multiply it by a circle, you go down by on a circle, you wrap a D3 brain around this space, which is, becomes a string, and you can wrap the string around the circle and give a momentum N to it. So you have a winding and some momentum N, and that gives you a, uh, that gives you a particular class of, of strings that you can, a BPS states in 5D that you can in principle relate to uh, properties of, of the, um, of this string. These, these string states uh, with any units of momentum correspond in the M2, M theory dual to M2 brains wrapped around the cycle C. So in the elliptic threefold, you have a two cycle C, but you also have the elliptic fiber. So the momentum gets related to the class in the, in the fiber that you're wrapping around. So N times the elliptic fiber. Now, if you calculate the, uh, the central charge of the, uh, of the corresponding string, it depends on the self-intersection of the, of the cycle as well as the C dot C1, the first chain class of the base. So you get a formula for the central charge of the string. And if you, N is large enough, if the momentum is large enough, you can compute the degeneracy of states and you get a formula like this for the entropy of the black hole, which is indeed agrees in the large end limit to the expected formula uh, for the BPS states. Now, this is not the most general charge configuration for M theory and elliptic Calabria. In general, there will be additional classes which is not captured by the base. Uh, in particular, there could be two cycles which, which correspond in the M theory picture to the U1 charges that emerge in the corresponding 60 theory. So, uh, so there are two cycle classes there are, I'm dividing the two cycle classes in the, in the Calabria to the elliptic class and to the base one. And then these P alphas are in the singular fiber. So you get extra U1 classes. 
And these correspond to the more the way rank of the uh, elliptic phi version. So you get some number of extra U1s in this scenario. So you can get the charges in all of these classes in the 5D. But in the context of the string context, you just wrap around the given cycle, and you have a momentum around it, around the circle. These classes correspond to the charges that the string carries. So in other words, the string will carry on the, on the word sheet extra U1s, U1 to the power of the rank, rank of the Mordell Weyl group. And using that, you can actually compute, the, again, the degeneracy of BPS states. More precisely, um, you can define, so there's a U1 to the rank of the Mordell Weyl group, and then you have a level of these U1s given by this uh, triple intersection where alpha, S alpha and S beta correspond to the dual four cycles to the, to the corresponding U1 singular fibers. And the C hat is the elliptic lift of, of the two cycles. In other words, the four cycle corresponding to the, to the total space of the elliptic vibration over that cycle. So the triple intersection of these four, these four cycles gives you, the, uh, gives you the level of this U1 uh, uh, to the power of the Mordell Way group. So this K appears in your, the, as the level on the string for the U1s. And so the formula that you would do is, as a canonical thing, you just, if you have a large momentum, it, you just subtract the, the corresponding charge that, the corresponding dimension that goes to the corresponding charge. So if you have a charge carried by L alpha, uh, you get uh, the shifted dimension, which is uh, L squared over 2K, which is this matrix multiplied by the Ls. Just, that just gives you the dimension of the, uh, the U1 portion of the, of the conformal dimension. And this is the amount left over, which gives you, the, again, the correct Cardi formula. So the Cardi formula gets shifted by this, by this amount. Anyhow, this, this you can, one can check. And again, it works beautifully. So there's no problem. So we have a formula which works in the limit of large n. Large n meaning large momentum number. So this is a nice picture, simple picture. So then you can ask, what is the gravity picture? What, how, what, is, what are we predicting? What are we trying to match this with? Well, the supergravity picture uh, is actually a very uh, rather elegant formula. So the idea is very simple. You take a charge class, so you're now thinking about M theory on a Calabria threefold, and you have a two cycle characterized by a charge uh, class Q. So you find the Kähler class on the Calabria whose square gives you that two cycle charge class. In other words, if you take the dual to the Kähler form, it would be a four cycle. The, self, the, self interse the intersection of that four cycle should correspond to a two cycle, which is the charge you're trying to get. This does not always have a solution. So when this does have a solution, you expect to have a macroscopic BPS supersymmetric gravity black hole. Sometimes there's no such thing, and that's perfectly allowed. So these would be a prediction of, of, uh, of what will happen. If there is such a solution, then you have a black hole entropy. And the entropy is simply given by, for that charge Q, you have found the K, you cube the K and integrate over the, uh, or do the triple intersection of that k class, and you find the entropy in this formula. So it's a relatively simple formula, and from this you see that the entropy scales like charge to the 3 halves, for example. Now, um, notice that uh, another way of saying this is you can say the same formula in a different uh, way, which I think is very useful to think about. If you fix a particular charge in the Calabria, you choose the Kähler class on the Calabria, which minimizes the volume of that class, subject to the total volume of Calabria being fixed to, let's say, 1. That, that value of the Kähler class is what's called the attractive value, which means that as you solve the supergravity equation, as you approach the horizon of the black hole, the Kähler class changes from infinity from wherever you started with to this attractive value. And near the horizon, when you do the computation to get the entropy, you get this formula. So that's basically the, the idea of how you get this formula. But mathematically, it's a very simple formula. The idea is that you have this K and you have this Q. This is a prediction that you will have holomorphic cycles which are ample enough that, in some sense, movable, that you can actually calculate their entropy and get non-zero answers if k squared is equal to q, that you have such solutions. 
Now, let's go back to the case of F theory we were talking about. In the case of F theory, when we were talking about large N, N corresponds to the class of the elliptic fiber. And if this class is large, if you want to minimize the volume, you want to take the elliptic fiber to be small because you have a large winding around the elliptic fiber. And therefore, the large N limit geometrically in the F theory language means elliptic fiber shrinks to zero. So the Cardi limit for the elliptic vibration in the context of matching to M theory uh, black holes means take the elliptic fiber, go to zero size. That's basically the, the upshot of this kind of calculation suggestion. So this comparison for microscopic black hole entropy for M theory on elliptic cloud BR uh, is satisfactory. However, this does not cover the non-elliptic ones. And this had been bothering me for many years many decades, and I, anybody who, I always heard people say, oh yeah, black hole entropy are always related to strings. I would say, no, there's counterexample, M theory and quintic. I would always give this example because it's not elliptic, and I didn't know how to do it using strings. So M theory and quintic, the famous Calabia, the basic Calabia, does not have such a description, and therefore, what do you do? So again, the question is, you take from 11 dimension down to five dimension on the quintic, M2 brains can wrap about two cycles in the Calabia. The usual calculation of topological string counts these holomorphic curves. There's a BPS formula predicted by supergravity. Can you match these? That's the question. And the question is, is there any string somehow looming around the corner somewhere? That was the question we we're trying to understand. OK. So the basic idea is that, well, even though quintic is not elliptic, it's connected. Oh, the Calabia is presumably all connected in some form, and therefore you can go to an elliptic one. Connect it, do a geometric transition to connect the quintic to elliptic one and use the string there. That sounds like a strange construction. We're talking about quintic. Why do you go to elliptic one? That's, that's a bizarre thing. Well. It is a bizarre thing if you're interested in the exact black hole BPS entropy, but we are interested in BPS black hole entropy index. And therefore, we may have a chance if you're just talking about the index. The question is, can we make a transition which respects the index, that the index does not change? That's the question. If we can do that, then there is no difference between the quintic and elliptic threefold if we can make such a transition. And then we can try to use the elliptic one and do the calculation there and say that this does not depend on the deformation. And we are back to the quintic, and we are done. That is the strategy. Is that clear? So we are trying to see if this strategy works. So the idea is, you look at the quintic. You solve the attractor equation, which is k squared equals to q. You deform the complex structure of the quintic, and it turns out, indeed, there is a deformation of the quintic, where you go to a degenerate complex structure, for which you get a degenerate elliptic vibration over a base, some base. Some base. But actually, this is, not, this is a genus 1 vibration. It's not elliptic vibration with a section. So this is sometimes called a genus 1 vibration. So you can do this relatively easily. And, um, Then you can hope to say, okay, so we, are, we, are, we did the, ha we, did the uh, we, we have gone to the place we want to be. The trick is that the formation of the hypermultiplet or complex structure does not affect the black hole entropy index. They are decoupled, so you, you don't need to know about them. They're, their degeneracy and all that don't talk with each other. And therefore, you can reliably calculate it there. So this leads to identifying the leading charge behavior of the black hole entropy to the elliptic genus of a particular string. Namely, what does that mean? Go to the single elliptic Calabia threefold. Find the configuration of charges that you're interested in whose attractor value is the singular Calabia. And use that to calculate that of uh, the, uh, the, the quintic. However, we can say it a bit more precisely what this means. In fact, one can, uh, we, we can do it in the following way. We don't, in other words, the attractor value that I was talking about was only true for large charges. 
we can actually compute the exact values for any charges in this way. Namely, you study, suppose you go to a Calabia that you know how to get, uh, that you know how to count, and let's call the corresponding, uh, let's call the corresponding states, uh, the charges, the degeneracies of the charges, let's call A and Q. I've ignored the spin for now. So you have extra charges now because you have some other charges that wasn't in the game when you made this geometric transition. You lose some of the charges, but that doesn't matter because it's like Higgsing, and you're interested in fixing the number of BPS states of a given charge Q where you don't care about the other charges. Said differently, if you were trying to compute the topological string amplitudes from one to the other, you get some extra parameters on one side that you're degenerating to one side which you don't care about and you compute the topologically on the other side. That's another way of saying it. So therefore, you can calculate the, the topological string amplitudes by this transition if you wanted to, if you could do it on one side. However, here you have to compute all these charges, and therefore this will correspond to computing the, not just one string, but a collection of strings. So we map the problem of counting the BPS black hole degeneracy of the quintic to the calculation of BPS degeneracies driven by a collection of strings that we have to sum up to get the full answer. So we are really suffering now. We are not just one string, but a collection of them have to be in the game. Nevertheless, let's proceed. So we are getting a hard problem, but anyhow, we are, we, are, we are forging ahead. We find the surprise, which may have been anticipated. You see, the attractor value for the elliptic threefold corresponding to the point of the transition to the non-elliptic threefold is far from the 60 limit. In other words, you can deform the quintic to become elliptic, but the elliptic fiber and the base sizes are roughly the same size at the time of transition. Now, you can choose a different charge whose attractor value would have been elliptic fiber shrinks, and the base is large, and then you can use your Cardi formula. But the limit you're ending up is not that limit. The transition point, the elliptic fiber is not small anymore at that attractive value, and therefore you have not so large an N compared to the central charge. So in this limit, we cannot cross the Cardi formula for the asymptotic growth of states. In other words, one of the hopes of this description of using string was at least in some limit, you can actually use it to compute it. Here we got string, actually a collection of strings, but the limit of charges that's relevant for this calculation is out of this, uh, is not in the regime that we are at. So in other words, you cannot use the Cardi formula to compute the asymptotic growth because we are not at asymptotic value of the, uh, of the, of the levels. So basically the picture is like this. Yeah, they have a quintic. You deform the complex structure to make it singular. But now this corresponds to a particular black hole charges in the elliptic vibration for which the n, the value of n and the base are not too different. And if you make n much, much larger to get to the elliptic one, you do get a description which is valid. So this is the regime where the Cardi formula is valid. But you're interested in this kind of values where n is not that large. And so it may fail. Question is, does it fail or does it not fail? So differently now, instead of reproducing the gravity answer, we can turn it around. The gravity answer is going to predict for us the corrections to the Cardi formula if they don't agree. In other words, now we don't have any right to expect that the Cardi formula works, but we at least can turn it around and use the gravity answer to find the correction to the Cardi formula in this regime. Of course, if we knew the exact elliptic genus, if we can actually find what are the strings, what degrees of freedom live on it, and compute the elliptic genus, we are done. We don't need to take any asymptotic formula, but that's not easy to do, so we don't know that, how to do such a thing. So the strategy now changes. Instead of reproducing the supergravity answer, we use the supergravity answer to see how the Cardi formula gets corrected. So, uh, oops. So let's go back to Quintic again. 
Now, a little bit more detail. So we want to make the transition from quintic to elliptic threefold. So it's elliptic Calabia is, is makes transition. There are, two, there are two natural ways we can do this. One is to a Calabia, which has a genus 1-5 ratio. Another one is to have a genus 1-5 ratio together with the section, in other words, elliptic threefold. We can do both of them. The formulas are simpler for the, for the one with the section, but the, the geometry is a bit more complicated because we have one extra Keller class. But otherwise, the methodologies are not that different. I'll, I'll describe both of them. So let's do the one, first of all, correspond to a genus 1 vibration. So, so you take, uh, you, you consider a polynomial of degree 5, which is the description of the quintic in terms of five variables that we have. We tune the complex structure so that the equation for the quintic looks like this, where u and v are uh, degree 1 in x, and q is a degree 3 in, in x. So you go to a point where the, the, uh, you can write the, the quintic in terms of determinant of this equation, this matrix. So you're, you're at this singular point. And then you blow up, basically, that, that point to a P2. So you define, you define now y1, y2, y3, determinant being 0, satisfy this equation. Said differently, we are considering um, the, the, the surfaces, the, the uh, Calabia defined inside P2 times P4 with these equations given by these weights. And the y coordinate gives rise to a map to P2 whose fibers are Calabia 1 forms, i.e., elliptic curves. Genus 1 vibration is coming from that. So you have a genus 1 vibration over P2. As I said, the, this one does not admit a section, but with a little work, and I will show you the example where you, you can get a elliptic calavia with a section. So we can now compare with the supergravity answer. So you, again, we have this formula I was telling you about where the corresponding charge, the two cycle charge, is n times elliptic fiber, some two cycle class some U1 charges, and we want to compare this with the formula from the supergravity, which is captured by, a, if you fix the charge Q, you find the Kähler class corresponding to K square equals to Q, and you plug it into this formula. That's the prediction of the supergravity answer. So, um, so the Cardi formula will give you, uh, the naively it's this one that I was telling you about, N minus the shift due to the U1 charges, but actually, there's a slight shift if you want to get a more accurate formula because the actual momentum gets shifted due to the brain charge by a term C1.C. So if you have a, want to have a more accurate version of Cardi's formula, there's a further correction, uh, C1.C. And C squared uh, and the, the, the central charge, et cetera, of the conformal theory has been captured by the leading term, which is 1 half C squared there, term that we have put there. So, so I call this S of Cardi and a slightly more improved version of it I call S of Cardi prime. So there are two different formulas we want to ch check with. And we want to compare it with the supergravity answer. So we will calculate both of them. So S is a supergravity answer. S Cardi prime over S is the ratio for the improved Cardi formula compared to the supergravity answer. And S Cardi over S is the un, un, unimproved one. And we, we land, so you ask, what about the charge classes that you land to correspond to this singular uh, version of this elliptic Calabia? You find the ratio of the charge in the fiber to the base is 5 over 21. In other words, this is no, not nearly uh, close to the large end limit. The f namely, the fiber and the base are roughly the same size as the attractor value. So this, we don't expect the Cardi formula to work well, which we should have had n over m much, much bigger than 1. Of course, we can look at this formula and compute this for the elliptic one for large values of n, where we know it should have agreed, and extrapolate back to the value 5 over 21, 
where we can see whether it agrees or not to this prediction. So on the, on the following plot I'm going to show you, the, perhaps I should shift over, but what, we will see what happens to this curve. Let me, perhaps I should go over there. Um, let me just show you the curve. So, so now you think about this as a comparison on the elliptic Calabria threefold charges, which is captured by an N elliptic class, and M is the base class. If N is much, much bigger than M, in fact, not even not much, much, if even a factor of two or three bigger, you find that the improved Cardi formula is pretty good. It matches the supergravity answer very, very nicely, even if N is a factor of two or three higher than the base charge class. The non-Cardi formula is a little less. Uh, the non-improved one is a bit worse, but still not too bad. But as you come to the value that you're interested in, and the value that we are interested in is over here, one of them actually becomes imaginary. So it's that bad. The improved Cardi formula, if you extrapolate it back to the value that would have been quintic, gives you an imaginary entropy, which makes no sense. And the non-improved one would give you some positive number, but you don't trust it. So this shows the Cardi formula fails, or more on a positive way of saying it, is you know what is the correction to the Cardi formula to compute the elliptic genus of that string for that n. So that's the, the way to, to, to perhaps think about this example. Now, uh, I should go back here. Um, you could have asked, when, when would it have worked? Could there have been any chance? Can we geometrically see what is the condition that the Cardi formula would have worked to leading order better than this? Indeed, there is a geometric condition, and that is why <laughs> we got lucky with the first examples that we, kind of, we studied in the back, back in the days where we had K3 cross T2 or T6. That is because the volume of these elliptic threefolds is a product of the volume of the elliptic fiber times the base. It's just a product. If the elliptic Calabria threefolds volume was a product of the elliptic class times the volume of the base, then there would be no leading correction in the large, in, into the Cardi formula, even as you came in from supergravity. So supergravity correction is precisely big when the volume of the elliptic Calabria threefold is not a product of the elliptic class times the base class. So that is, that is the geometric way of saying what, what happens and what, what is the correction. So the corrections that become significant are precisely from non-factorization of the product to the uh, volume to the product of the fiber and the base class. So, and that's the example we are seeing. Now, you might have thought, well, maybe this has to do with anything to do with the elliptic vibration being genus one with no section. But if, if it's, what about if there's section? You can write another one. Uh, you can improve on this. You can get the elliptic vibration with a section. If you go to a further degeneration, so you, you can define uh, uh, the quintic inside a P1 times P2 times P4. In other words, you can blow up another P1. So you introduce two more Kähler classes. Um, and you basically write the quintic in this particular form. You're in, you in a more, more degenerate version of it. But then you blow up P1 and P2. And you can describe it by these weights. You can describe the corresponding blow up geometry. And uh, you get a perfectly fine one there. And then you ask the same question, and the same thing happens again. That is, you compute the corrections. Uh, you can compute the predictions uh, from the black hole answer, from the uh, supergravity, from the Cardi formula to the supergravity answer, and you find that neither of them uh, does does well in the region that you're interested in. But asymptotically, of course, they work well as they should have. Okay. Um, that is an interesting negative story, I would say, perhaps. But perhaps we should have expected. If there is no obvious string in the game, you can push a string on the problem, but it's not going to help you much. That's the lesson we are learning here. Namely, there is a string, but that's not a natural string in this context. We are forcing it on the problem. And if you do that, that's fine. But then you learn something about the string. The string is not going to teach you much. In, that, in some sense, that's the, the, the lesson we are learning here. 
So let me actually conclude, even though I'm a bit ahead of time, maybe lunch is not too far away for, 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 for us. So, um, so BPS black holes in M-theory compactification, uh, are non-elliptic ones, can be identified with the elliptic genus of a collection of strings. Um, if we could actually compute it. The Cardi formula fails, generally speaking, to capture the relevant pieces precisely because we are in a funny regime. We are in a regime where the excitation number, uh, the level above the, the vacuum for the conformal theory is of order of the square root of central charge, which is nowhere near the asymptotic regime we are interested in when C is large, and that's why it fails. So we know the failure. We know how the failure can get corrected. That's a prediction we are making for that string. And once, hopefully, at some day where we can compute such strings and their elliptic genus, then we can verify how these formulas work explicitly. So I think with that, I will stop. Thank you. introduced ratio here in any way as a relation to the recombination ratio or the, uh, uh, the charge to mass ratio? You're talking about N over M? Uh, what ratio are the, you talking uh, about? Uh, uh, the uh, S cardi over S. Oh, not, not in particular, no. I mean, it's just the f two formulas we're checking against each other. It doesn't have anything to do with, with, gra uh, with gravity conjecture. No, no, no. Okay. In fact, as you saw, it became imaginary when, yes. when I went to the charge of interest for some of them. So no, not, not, there's nothing physical there. Uh, so have you tried for other Calabio apart from Quintic? I mean, uh, for all, no, I, I think this, will, this idea, I'm sure this will work in general. So there's a conjecture that all Calabios are connected. Therefore, you can connect all of them to elliptic threefolds. And I can, I can bet that this idea generally works that there is such a picture, but it's not going to be terribly useful if you're really interested in the leading behavior, unless you're interested in learning something about the correction to Cardi formula for that string. That's the basic I was thinking, like, if, if one could try for multiple examples and see if there is some trend that you can, you know, figure out more insights of the problem itself. I mean... No, you can geometrize, as I said. Yeah. We can geometrize what is that correction. Mm -hmm. There's, you can write a formula for that correction because, as I said, it has to do with the non-factorization of the volume. Yes. to the product of the elliptic to the base. Yeah, so, like, so therefore, that yeah. lack of factorization, there's a triple intersection formula. You can use that to find what the correction is and write it, write so it down. The, that but is like but one, understanding yeah. why Cardi picks up that correction is not easy. Yeah, so but I mean, I mean I, I'm asking this because uh, you know, when you have multiple examples, you could see this kind of product structure which, which you, for which you said that Cardi formula may go through. It may work, right? So to leading go order, it would, it, but you can make it go through because yeah. you, you, the triple intersection structure is such that the volume does not pick up in terms of... Okay, like so I was, I was asking it in the sense that when you go to some Calabria, which is having, for say, H11 more than 3, yeah. are equal to 3, so going to Taurus case or like K3 cross T2 type of cases, then you, maybe you could find some explicit example where it works. Yeah, no, so I that mean, was you, can, my you can find it, but I wouldn't, think, yeah. I wouldn't read much into the physics of it. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Thanks There's no reason it cannot exist. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Uh, uh, um, uh, I wanted to ask about what you said about learning something about the string. So can you take this kind of uh, uh, correction that you get from whatever supergravity calculation and then take it back to the quintic threefold and extract some new prediction or consistency check for some uh, count in higher genus? Uh, not, not necessarily. Well, it depends on what you mean. If I had exact calculation done, you mean? Or just general structure of it? Which one are you asking? I, I, I mean, if I understood what you were saying, you were saying whatever you can learn from the quintic gives you a prediction which is wrong, and then you, you, you can know the correction to this prediction. So that's... If you knew the full calculation for the quintic, then you would get an answer which was correct. Right. But, but knowing only some piece of it gives you an answer which is wrong. Right. And so, so what I'm asking you is that since you have this other thing to compare to, where you compare the uh, wrong thing and the right thing, if you can take that difference, move back to the quintic, and learn something. I mean, I think you were saying learn something about the string. Did you learn something about 
uh, curve counts on the quintic in this way? And if not, why not? Not really, because all I'm using is a triple intersection of the quintic. I'm just using the trivial fact of supergravity, which is just the 5t cubed term of the quintic, and everything is there. You're not going to learn more than that from, about the quintic. We are using it the other way. The supergravity is smart enough to give us a prediction for the large charge behavior. That's the magic of the beckinson hawking entropy and the duality between supergravity picture and the microscopic picture, which is very non-trivial. So this is an example of it. We can actually use that to make a mathematical prediction about what are the structure of the elliptic genus under corrections in this case. The, of course, from the physics side, we want to also go backwards, namely from microscopic prediction, go to this classical geometric uh, formula we have and try to recover it. And in this case, it's going to be hard, as I explained. So uh, it's not like it cannot be, but I don't think we're going to learn much from it. But I do want to emphasize, again, I said it already once, but I think that the community of uh, uh, string, uh, string uh, enthusiasts who are mathematically inclined should put maximum effort to try to find the topological string amplitudes to all genus for compact Calabria, which we still do not know. It's embarrassing, I would say. Yeah, thanks, Karun, for the, for the nice talk. I just wanted to comment that there is one setup where the black string uh, description is very effective in the compact Calabria case, is, is when you're trying to count four-dimensional black holes of this uh, D4, D2, D0 form. And those, of course, come from wrapping M5 brain on, on, a, on, on, a, on a divisor. That's right. And you get very That's precise. That's the MSW construction. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. And you get very precise uh, uh, control on the asymptotics. So, of course, you're asking a different question, which is to understand five-dimensional black holes. Yeah, but uh, even there, well, you don't know how to do it with D6 brain, for example. So the existence actually, of so, a... Well, you, you can actually use row crossing to relate these perhaps. D4 indices to D6 and then get information yeah, indirect, about, then about indirectly the, connected uh, to a string. Uh, then, then indirectly connected to that string that you have. Yeah, yeah, yes. precisely. So, yeah. It, so these are along, some of the along these lines. That there's so, in some problems, there's a natural string around. In some other cases, you can relate it to a, some, some string, which is what we were trying to do here. Yeah. So, of course, these work crossing elements are very complicated. There's a dense set of rules, but you can, you can use yeah. them if No, I mean, there, there, the string examples, there, there are plenty of beautiful string examples which give you the black hole entropy. That's not to diminish the importance of string picture for black holes. Uh, the elliptic genus is uh, an index, while the Cardi formula is a degeneracy. In general, they need not be equal. So, when will you expect? the index to be equal to Oh, oh yes, I think I, I already mentioned that. So when the Calabria, elliptic Calabria volume is equal to the volume of the elliptic fiber to, times the volume of the base, I expect the leading terms to agree. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for the nice talk. So if you uh, take this three-section genus one vibration for the conifold transition, what the topological string actually encodes is not the elliptic genus, but a twisted elliptic genus, right? So our first question would be... Sorry, what do you mean by it's not elliptic genus, twisted elliptic genus? What do you mean? Well, from the F-theory perspective, you've turned on a discrete Wilson line by going from F-theory to M-theory, and this shows up in the elliptic genus by taking the trace over the twisted... Yes, uh, that's space. what you mean, okay. Yes, so I wanted the first question to ask how that enters the story, and yes. second, in the same moduli space, you also have a mum point which is associated to the twined elliptic genera, and if um, this gives you a different result, or if you have looked into that. The model weight class is related to that Wilson loop that you're talking about. So that ELF correction is important for ca calculating it correctly, when you put that phase. But in the genus 1 vibration, you didn't have a non-trivial model while group. That's I mean. right. For the genus 1, you, do that, you don't get that. You don't need that. That's not, not needed for that case. You just get the irregular Regular string. There's no, there's no Wilson line there. Well, there is a discrete Wilson line, and you have it. You can have some cases a discrete Wilson line, so it corresponds to a discrete analog of the spectral flow. That, that, that's what you're asking. In other words, the twisted sectors, there's Z2, for example, sometimes. Then you're talking about the discrete Wilson line. But that's when you want to get, that does not affect the leading Cardi formula either way. So it doesn't affect what I just told you. That you would have to do it if you have actually a string and you know how to go to the sector of that string, which is that Z2 you're talking about, and calculating explicitly. But the central chart does not change. But what I mean is if you take the F theory associated to the genus 1 yes. progression, you have a discrete Z3 symmetry. Yes. So you would go then and to the, the twisted sector of Z3. Exactly, but this is what the topological string no, on this Calabria calculates. I know, I know. But I'm just saying that for the, what you're saying is perfectly correct. 
But for the calculations what I'm doing, it does not affect the leading central charge because the central charge is the same whether you're in the untoothed sector, toothed sector. I don't even, I didn't even go to that level of detail to even describe the discrepancy. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, a, it's even surprising in 2D CFT that you can use the Cardi formula when n is of order c. Uh, so usually it's only uh, works asymptotically. And in 2D CFT, it's known that uh, you can extend the regime if you assume some sparseness condition on the spectrum that was established by Hartman, Stoica, and um, mm -hmm. Keller. So can you comment on whether you expect some maybe even stronger version of the sparseness uh, to hold? And you can uh, hope that some version of the Cardi formula holds in some extended regime? I wouldn't know wh why it should work a priori. I mean, for example, here we have n of order root c even, not, not c. Mm -hmm. uh, so, no, I mean, to me that, I don't have any insights into the question you're asking. It's an interesting question, but I don't think I don't have any insights to add. Okay, thanks. So, uh, so as, as, as the underlying, uh, underlying thing looks like, you know, to, to have the, kind of anisotropy between fiber and base. So I think the Calabria, which one should look for this case is minimal H11 equal to two. Because if you start with Quintic anyway, I mean, even after making this transition, and then you are squeezing to a single modulus, right? So that, that means that all this distinguish, I mean, all this fiber and base will have equal volume. I mean, this is the outcome, I think, right. what you are getting. So at least one should go beyond this Quintic to test these things. I, I mean, I'm sorry to insist, but because the underlying requirement is that you, you need some kind of hierarchy or, you know, anisotropy between fiber and base to have it in the end. So. Uh, something like K3 hyper Calabria, say in you know this one one two two six or one one two two well, four. So I I think that generically I don't expect to have a hierarchy between the elliptic vibration and the base class, as long as the uh, H11 is finite. <laughs> okay. In other words, you can imagine a situation where you have an infinite sequence of Calabria which we don't have, in which case you get a collective a collection of them, and as you go through them, you find the H1 the relevant elliptic fiber gets smaller, and so the charge gets relatively big compared to the other ones. That's possible in principle, but for a two or three or four, I don't think you'll get there. Okay, thanks a lot, thank you. Um, when you say elliptic genus, uh, which one do you mean? What do you mean, which one do I mean? The usual elliptic genus. You have super conformal theory. On the one side, you have supersymmetry. On the other one, you don't. You just compute it. Okay, I guess, like, uh, from topological perspective, it's you're pushing forward one in elliptic cohomology, and that has to, you, you're choosing some elliptic curve or family of curves. No, so the, to be more precise, you have a super conformal theory on the world, which has supersymmetry on one side, yeah. and you don't have supersymmetry on the other side. You take a index on the supersymmetric side and you get the partition function which depends on only on the non-supersymmetric side. That's, that's what we do. Okay. Think about, yeah, on a torus, you can think about it, yeah. Partition function on a torus, yes. Well, there's, there's a torus which you can interpret it in terms of a circle that the string is winding around and a time, if you want to say it in the target language. If there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. <laughs>